Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us uh, for our second Legicate Middle Temple panel event. In um, My name is Kerry, and I'm part of our Legicate team. Today is a panel event about judicial review, which is very much a hot topic at the moment, and so something very natural for Middle Temple and Legicate to talk about. If I can introduce you to Fiona Scolding, QC, our chair, uh, who will then introduce you to the panel herself. But Fiona has a wide ranging public law expertise and is a first tier tribunal judge. But within her work, she focuses on children and education. So an absolute perfect match for us at Legicate as our chair this year. So thank you very much. And I will hand over to Fiona. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, and uh, good evening to all of you. We have three unbelievably eminent speakers who are going to hopefully provide you with an hour's worth of lively debate and discussion uh, this evening. We have uh, David Newberger, a previous Supreme Court Justice, one of the most eminent jurists of his generation, and someone who uh, I was just on the phone to before this evening said, and one of the nicest men you could ever meet. Um, so we have uh, the pleasure of his company tonight. We also have Joshua Rosenberg, known to everyone, whether they've ever read any legal journalism or not. Um, currently the presenter of Radio 4's Law in Action and various documentary series and an active on Twitter, shall we say, where you always get the best information about the cases, his live feeds, live tweeting. The cases is always um, is, is something which you should all follow if you don't at the moment. Last but by no means least, we have Alison Pickup, the legal director of the Public Law Project, a project I think started by Sir Henry Brooke and Sir Stephen Sedley, both eminent jurists and members of the Court of Appeal, I think 40, 40, over 40 years ago now. The Public Law Project provides research, advice, and brings strategic litigation about, surprise, surprise, public law. Alison was, as I understand it, a barrister in private practice, before she became its legal director. So I know we've got a lot of, we've got a mixture of um, participants tonight. So we are gonna aim this at the sort of uh, university undergraduate level, so to speak. So for those of you I know who are benchers or at more senior level, you'll just have to um, keep calm for five minutes <laughs> whilst I ask the first question. So Alison, what is judicial review? Thanks, Fiona. Uh, so judicial review is a legal process, usually in the administrative court, but it can also be in the upper tribunal, um, by which those who are affected by government decisions can challenge uh, those decisions and ask the court to rule on their lawfulness and to grant them a remedy if they hold that the decision is unlawful. In a nutshell, that's what judicial review is. Okay. I can expand a little bit and say and why well, it's how many. How many judicial review cases are roughly brought a year in England and Wales? Because um, we have to notice that Scotland and Northern Ireland both have separate jurisdictions in this respect. So, yes, slightly. Um, it's the number that's sort of going down, um, but it's currently roughly around just under 3,000 a year in the High Court. I think it's around 5,000 in the Upper Tribunal. Okay. So we're only talking about 8,000 cases a year for yeah. a populace of 66 million or so. Yeah, those are the cases that that, uh, that go to court, yeah. Okay, and are, what sort of topics are they about? So what would your typical judicial review be about? Be a whole range of things. Um, anything where the government makes decisions, where government, central and local government, public authorities make decisions which affect people's lives. So it can be about planning, educational provision, community care, immigration decisions, um, housing, access to legal advice, access to court itself, um, government policies, like there's basically everything that you can think of where government affects us. Right, so there. every aspect of any, where the government attempts to regulate the relationship we have with it, or the relationship we have with each other, exactly. um, can be subject with a very few exceptions to judicial review. Exactly. So um, David, passing to you, why is judicial review an important part of not just the English legal system, but of our constitution, unwritten though it is? 
I, I suppose if you were asked to identify the two most important pillars of a free society, our idea of a free society, you would say democratic government and the rule of law. And the rule of law is more ancient, been more well established, longer established even than de democracy. And the rule of law means that you have laws by which you have to live your life and you're entitled to live your life. Uh, and the laws have to be obeyed by you and by others. And if you don't have that situation, uh, you quickly have a society that falls apart. And part of the rule of law, and one of the most important parts of the rule of law, is that the government, not just the government in Westminster, but all parts of government, local government and public bodies, obey the law and carry out the law properly. And as we all know, there are so many laws and so many things going on in life that even with the best will in the world, sometimes people will make mistakes and get the law wrong. And you individually, each of you in the audience, each of everybody in the country, if your life is interfered with wrongly by somebody in government making a wrong decision, the rule of law, in my view, requires uh, that you are able to go to court, put your case before a judge who will decide whether your rights have been infringed or not, and will decide what to do about it. Yeah. Judges have to be careful, to be fair, uh, to be impartial, uh, to be careful, and to remind themselves that they are not necessarily the experts which the decision makers are. But nonetheless, they are carrying out, as the very expression suggests, a very important review function, which is fundamental to a free society. Thank you, David. Joshua, from your perspective as a journalist, why is judicial re review important to us as a society? And um, why do you think its preservation is of utmost importance? Well, picking up on what Lord Newberg has said, Parliament makes the laws, but Parliament can't take every decision that affects us in our day-to-day -day lives. And so Parliament gives powers to ministers, to local authorities, to all sorts of public bodies to take decisions which affect us in our working lives. And those decisions are limited. And if a decision maker, maybe a minister, maybe a local authority, exceeds the powers given to that decision maker by Parliament or misuses them, acts corruptly, act incompetently, but nevertheless abuses or misuses or fails to apply the rules relating to those powers, it's essential that the courts should step in and ensure that the decision maker keeps to the right principles. It's important to understand that the courts are not there to take the decision themselves to decide whether somebody should have planning permission, somebody should I don't know what, whatever it is that the decision maker has to decide, they are there to make sure that the person entrusted with that right to make a decision takes into account things that the decision maker should take into account, doesn't take into account irrelevant things, and therefore, as Lord Newberger says, ensures that the rule of law applies to us, not just journalists, uh, but to the rest of us. As journalists, it's very interesting just to watch how the courts do this. Um, but Alison, I, I think both David and Joshua have been keen to stress that judicial review is about a very wide range of different subjects, as have you yourself. Obviously, if you were to read the newspapers, the only judicial reviews you would have heard about would have been likely to have been the ones that were brought by Gina Miller concerning um, various aspects of the EU withdrawal bill and potentially um, maybe the most recent judicial well, it's not really a judicial review, but sort of a judicial review by, for example, about Shabima, Shabina Begum and whether or not she, she does or doesn't have the right to come to this country to fight her case about the deprivation of her citizenship. So if you read the newspapers, you would, well, certainly the central government newspapers and Twitter, you would think that those are the only cases. Um, as far as the public law project is concerned, which is a charity devoted to kind of raising awareness and understanding of judicial review, but also representing individuals or bringing claims. What have been the kind of areas that you've intervened in 
where you think you've made the most valuable difference acting on behalf of claimants in judicial review or clarifying the law generally? Yeah. Give, give me a couple of examples that don't involve Brexit or, or yeah. immigration. We did get involved in Brexit as well, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, one that, an area that we've done a lot of work on in recent years has been around access to legal aid. So actually people's ability to get publicly funded advice to help them to go to court on a whole range of issues. And so just last year, we acted for a woman who was um, a survivor of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And she was told that she was ineligible for legal aid because of trapped capital in her family home. And the legal aid agency said that its hands were tied by the legal aid regulations about financial eligibility and because of the value of the home, they would they that she couldn't get legal aid. So we, on her behalf, we, we went to court and the court in its judgment clarified that in fact, in those circumstances, the legal aid agency has a discretion to give to disregard the capital that, that, that's tied up in the home and can't be accessed and to give the person legal aid when she needed it in order to face her abuser in court. So that's an example. And there are several other cases around um, legal aid um, that we've been involved in around that. Um, there's been a lot of cases in recent years around entitlement to welfare benefits. Yes. Um, and I think that's just because of the scale of the benefit system and um, the austerity measures that have been taken, sort of changing the rules around benefits that have had a lot of implications. Um, so a case that PLP intervened in I want to say last year, but I suspect it was 2019, as we know 2020 doesn't exist, um, <laughs> is a case called RR, which was a follow on from a case which challenged the um, so called bedroom tax, yeah. where the Supreme Court had held that there was um, unlawful discrimination in the bedroom tax rules. And the question in RR was what should happen then in the subsequent individual cases, should those uh, discriminatory rules be applied to people? Um, or could the tribunal say, no, these rules have been found to be discriminatory, we're going to disapply them, and, and you'll be entitled to benefit um, in the appropriate way. So those are just a couple of examples of the kinds of cases we've been involved in. Okay, so if we maybe sort of move on to the sort of hot topic of today, which is the government last summer asked uh, Lord Fawkes, uh, who is an eminent barrister and was a justice minister until 2015 and sits in the House of Lords now as a crossbench peer, asked him and a group of senior members of the bar, largely, uh, to um, ask themselves some questions and, in effect, undertake a review and a report about administrative law, but largely about judicial review, effectively saying, has it gone too far? Have we done too many things with it? Should it be reined in? And is it working? And the answers, as I read the report to those questions is, largely it works quite well. No, it hasn't gone too far. There are some minor adjustments that may need to be made to process. And there are two slightly larger adjustments that we think should be made, both of which I think we're going to talk about. Um, but largely, we think it works quite well. And everybody else has told us it works quite well. And they had, I think, somewhere over 300 consultation responses. Now you might think, well, that isn't very many in the context of the fact that the exams consultation had over 100,000 <laughs> consultation responses. But for a consultation about legal issues, I can assure you that is a sort of a bonanza. And certainly everybody I know, every firm of solicitors, every set of chambers, every legal academic, every organization of um, the judges where they could do so all submitted responses to this. So it was the kind of the, the some people would say that it was the considered view of users of the system, whether they were government, barristers, lawyers, individuals representing claimants. The government, however, in its wisdom has decided that there may need that they may wish to go further in the reforms they wish to make. So about three weeks ago, they published a 60 page document which identifies areas which they are thinking about. Now, I should simply say this isn't set out in any bill. Um, it's not something which they're definitely proposing that they're going to do, but they float a number of suggestions for fairly radical changes to judicial review. And what I think we'd all like to spend the rest of the session doing is discussing the merits or otherwise of those changes and what impact that might have upon the sorts of cases that Alison and Joshua were talking about, whether or not they could still be brought and how effective judicial review would be for um, the individual who wishes to challenge unlawful 
decision making. So turning first to Alison, I wanted to, I wanted to discuss um, between all of us what we think about the first change that the government is suggesting that it's going to legislate on, which is to create a right to suspend what's called a quashing order. So there are various sorts of remedies you can get in judicial review and it should be noted and it's very important that they're all discretionary. So a judge could say your case is really interesting but actually I'm not going to give you anything at all because in order to change the law it would just be it would be too difficult, it would be too hard, it would cause too many problems. So the courts can say, yes, things have gone wrong, but I'm not going to give you any remedy. I mean, it very rarely does that. However, there are a number of different remedies, one of which is ordering some ordering the body to do something. Another one of which is called a quashing order, which is in effect saying whatever it is that you have issued, whether that's a set of rules, a set of guidance, um, some what's called a statutory instrument, which is a piece of legislation that has gone through Parliament, but it's not primary legislation, um, we can squash that. And it, it's, it's as if it never happened, as if it didn't exist, or we can grant you declarations. So we can say that this is the way that the law should be. So there's a number of different remedies. One of the ideas that the government is going to um, legislate on is to have um, suspended quashing orders so that um, the order wouldn't necessarily automatically quash a decision, but you would be able to suspend it so the court would be able to say, OK, what I need you to do, government, is to change these regulations to get rid of one, two, three and four, and then come back to me in four months and I'll decide whether or not to make a quashing order or not. What do you think about that as an idea? I mean, it's something which came out of the review and which the uh, Falks review recommended. Alison, do you have any views about it? So I think in principle, what's really important is that the judges have um, a range of tools at their disposal to find mm. to create a just solution for the case before them. And one of the the just the in the report of the independent review of the Forks panel, their reason for this proposal was partly because of a case about student tuition fees. Yes. Where Early, yeah. yeah, in Hurley and Moore, where they found that the Secretary of State had acted unlawfully in increasing the tuition fees, maximum tuition fees that could be charged to students, but they declined to quash the regulations because they were concerned about all the people who relied on those regulations up to the point of their decision. So they effectively issued a declaration. So they just said, this was unlawful, but we're not going to give that remedy. Now, in when you look at it against that context, you can see that for the if that court had been able to say, well, we're going to make a quashing order, but we're going to suspend it. And we're going to give the Secretary of State, I don't know, 28 days to try and fix this. 28 days is my high dream. Um, to fix this issue. And if they don't fix it to our satisfaction, then the regulations will be quashed. So you can see that the court having that discretion, that mm -hmm. there might be some merit in that. What I think is concerning about this proposal, as with another one that I think we'll go on to discuss, in the government consultation is that they want to make this not just up to the judge to do the, the fair thing in the individual case but to create a presumption or to make it mandatory in certain kinds of cases and that I think is very worrying because that's about that that risks tying the judge's hand and reducing their ability to do justice which is ultimately what judges there for as Ordinary Burger will be able to say better than me but that that so I think there's a there's a nuance there I think as you say what the panel has proposed is relatively modest and could be beneficial in the in some cases what the government is consulting on goes further yeah so david from your perspective having sat as a judge would having a suspended quashing order have been a good tool in your armor in appropriate cases where you wanted to potentially say to a government department go away and get your house in order and i'll then make a decision as to what i'm going to do or do you think it just creates unnecessary uncertainty and lengthier and more complex litigation? As the discussion so far has shown, judicial review is a very multi-purpose tool, as it were. And therefore, instinctively, I feel that any increase in its flexibility is to be 
greeted with enthusiasm rather than rejected. Um, and one should also bear in mind that while it's terribly important that individual rights are protected, as we've all said, it's also right that the government is entitled to protection, because in one sense, the government stands, is meant to represent us all. In Parliament, it does. Um, when it comes to the executive, which is what we're talking about, the civil service, local authorities and so on, they're not uh, democratically accountable, which is why they should be and are subject to judicial review. But they do have a right to have their interest taken into account because that's the public interest. And I think, therefore, as Alison has so carefully and well expressed it, um, this power is a good power to include. Where I get very jumpy, as she does, is the idea that the government should start telling judges when and how they exercise this power. Yeah. I think the whole essence of judicial review is, as I say, flexibility. And the other essence of judicial review is, or another important aspect of judicial review, fundamental to everything in society, is judicial independence. And you really want to keep Parliament's nose out of judging in the same way as you want to keep the judges' noses out of Parliament. And when it comes to deciding what to do about a particular case, leave it to the judges. Don't start telling the judges what to do. You wouldn't like them telling you in Parliament what to do and we should leave it like that. I suppose if I was a parliamentarian, what I might say, David, is, but the difficulty is, is that judges have been, well, there is a view amongst certain parliamentarians that judges have been sticking their nose in, so to speak, into decisions which have been made by parliament, because they would say that there's been a significant increase in the number of challenges that have been brought, particularly in respect of sort of central government policy, if one were to put it like that. Now, there's lots of debate about whether or not that is in fact the case, um, whether or not in fact there has been a large increase. In fact, I think there's been a significant decrease in the number of claims which have been issued over the past 10 years since there were some quite radical changes to legal aid in this area. But I mean, do you think that this is one of the consequences of, shall we say, a more active more judicial activism? And do you believe that there is such a thing as judicial activism in this country? I think judicial activism is a term that's used for against a judge whose decision you don't like. Yeah. Um, I, I think there are undoubtedly um, some judges who are temperamentally more ready to intervene in a particular area or in many areas uh, where decisions have been made than other judges. And that's because judges are human, they all have their different approaches. And um, to that extent, you can say one judge is more activist uh, than another. But on the whole, there's a fairly predictable uh, approach, which is what you should have in the law. Um, I think that undoubtedly over the past 60 years, there's been a substantial increase in judicial involvement in, in decisions. But in terms of domestic development by the judges and by people coming to court, that was most of that growth happened before the turn of the century. Yeah. And as you say, in the past 10 years, it's actually gone down. The other and most significant increase in judicial activism has come about because Parliament has ordered it, in effect, through the Human Rights Act, yes. um, which has increased in some areas judicial involvement, which some people may not approve of. But the trouble is you have to look at things, to use a terrible modern word, holistically. There will be one or two decisions, which I might think, which many might think, go too far. Yeah. There will be decisions where you will think the judges have been too timid. But to focus on the decisions you don't like, and then say the judges are too activists, falls into the error which Fiona, you yourself identified a minute ago, of looking at high profile cases or cases you don't like. It sounds a bit smug and one's got to be careful as an ex-judge, but I think on the whole, judges are anxious to reflect what's right for society and what society as a whole wants. And I, I don't think therefore it's fair to criticize them, although in individual cases, they will make decisions that you don't agree with. And I've made decisions which in retrospect, from time to time, I felt may not have been right. We're none of us perfect. No, and 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 oh, I suppose if I was representing claimants, what I would say is very often 
uh, some claimants would say that the judiciary is still too timid when it comes in particular to challenging central governmental power, particularly about things like welfare benefits. Alison, do you have any view about that? I'm thinking about there's been a whole run of cases where the courts have semi intervened, shall we say, to quash various aspects of the benefits regime, but haven't in fact quashed the central problem which everybody has gone to court about so they might carve out some exceptions for people with disabilities in respect of the what was known as the bedroom tax or the government calls it the spare room subsidy but didn't in fact quash the overall and overarching policy and found it's lawful and there was another case that went up to the supreme court last year about um whether or not child benefits should be cut for people who have more than two children, where I think very similar arguments were raised and we await the decision of the Supreme Court in that respect. But Alison, from your perspective as, a, as, a, as an ex-claimant barrister, as I know you were for a while, and as an organisation which often could be accused of activism, shall we say, and of being one of those activist lawyers that various people referred to last year, do you think the courts overstep the mark or have overstepped the mark in terms of the relationship between them and Parliament? And I mean, no, I mean, I think the answer and, and sort of coming back also to the sort of use of the word activist. I mean, as lawyers, you 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 use the law and you represent your clients using the law to try and challenge unlawful decisions which affect them. Um, that's the lawyer's role. And that's what we do. And the court's role is to look at the case that's been presented to them and decide whether the law has been broken or not. And I think that those cases that you cite are, are in some ways the best response to the charges of excessive activism because they show the judges being very, very careful actually to respect the proper boundaries of their role and to you know, case some issues which you might sort of think at first person when it's described well that's awful that you can't have you know that you can't have two bedrooms where whatever the reason is you know like the, the whole range of cases you say some involving disabilities some involving women who are in specially protected safe houses to protect them from abusive ex-partners and so on and actually the court has been very careful to respect the democratic function of parliament in setting those rules mm -hmm. and only to intervene where they've clearly gone outside the bounds of, of striking the correct balance um and where you know it, it's sort of nonsensical it's, it's it, no reasonable kind of decision maker would reach it and so I, I think those are really good important cases to talk about because they are the counterpoint to the cases which um often get cited as examples of judicial activism Joshua, do you think one of the difficulties might be that people now turn to the law when they're unhappy with what's gone on uh, in Parliament and where you have a Parliament with a very large majority, so lots of legislation can be passed. People, if they're disgruntled with various aspects of government policy, will use the law as a tool. And in fact, I thought it was interesting that one of the um, people who responded to the Falks consultation said, People use it because they don't have trust in the political process anymore, but they do have trust in the judiciary. Is that something in the course of your long and distinguished career in legal journalism? Do you think that there has been a move by particularly kind of non-governmental organisations, community enterprises, groups of people who are unhappy with particular aspects of government policy using the law because they feel that they can't use parliament or the political process doesn't serve them anymore. Yes, I think that's fair. And I think your description of uh, using the courts where uh, parliament seems impervious to reason um, is a good uh, way of summing up uh, the case we call Miller II, Gina Miller's uh, second challenge to the prime minister's decision to prorogue, suspend parliament for five weeks at a time when it was thought parliament needed to be sitting in order to discuss Brexit. We're talking about 2019. So yes, that is something that the courts do. Um, that was a unique case. I don't think it's ever going to recur. Uh, but there are examples of cases where campaign groups um, use the law. But then they're right to do so because it's important that the courts decide, coming back to the point I made at the outset, 
whether ministers, whether courts in some cases, have kept within their powers. Mm. Uh, and that is the job of the courts, and it's right that they should do that. Thank you. Now, sort of moving on to what, are, what could be considered to be the more controversial aspects of the government's <laughs> proposals, shall we say, or consultation. The first one of them is um, to identify that remedies, so we were just talking about the way that a judge can then determine how a decision maker responds to a decision if it finds that um, it has acted unlawfully, to make those prospective only, or to make it, and certainly there is some suggestion that all cases to do with statutory instruments, that any statutory instrument, if a judge finds that that has um, not been passed lawfully or that there are problems with it, any sort of legal problems, that in and of itself that will only be quashed prospectively rather than retrospectively. Now, David, um, if potentially, could you um, explain to us what that actually means in practice for somebody who brings a judicial review saying that a particular statutory instrument is wrong? And perhaps you'd like to explain as well why statutory instruments are so important within um, our parliamentary system. Well, statutory instruments are what's sometimes called secondary legislation. Parliament makes laws through statutes and statutes cannot be challenged uh, under our system. We haven't got a constitution unlike the United States where the courts can declare a statute passed by parliament uh, to be unlawful. It is the law. The courts can interpret the statute, but they can't uh, do more than that. But many statutes are, are quite general in nature and leave the details uh, of how things are to be done and how things are to work uh, for what's called secondary legislation. And they are documents which are drawn up by civil servants and approved by ministers uh, and issued by ministers, uh, but uh, they have to be what's called laid before Parliament, for Parliament to approve, normally by not objecting, but sometimes actually by supporting. But nonetheless, even though they are called legislation and are put before Parliament, the courts can review them under judicial review and say, for instance, uh, that this provision in the secondary legislation in the statutory instrument is unlawful because it's actually not what's permitted by the statute, which it's made under, or this is so unreasonable or irrational that it shouldn't be allowed to stand. Uh, that, that, that's um, secondary legislation and the court's involvement. Um, an example as to prospective and retrospective was given by Joshua Rosenberg in the discussions we all had before now, and I'm going to poach it because it's a very good one. Um, the, court, uh, uh, the Supreme Court decided uh, that uh, the government had acted unlawfully in imposing very large charges on individuals who wanted to bring claims in the employment tribunal. Uh, they had to pay £1,200 to bring a claim, even if it was only for a few hundred pounds, of underpayments that, they'd been not, that they were entitled to from their employ employers or discrimination or anything like that. And I was in the court at the time, we ruled that these were unlawful and we effectively quashed the ruling. So instead of the charges being nothing, which they'd been before, they had been £1,200 and we quashed them. As Joshua pointed out, uh, the effect of that would be that anyone who'd paid these unlawful charges could claim them back. So if you'd been forced to pay £1,200 to go to the Employment Tribunal, you could now get that money back, quite right too, in my view. But if this new legislation comes into force, as the government is talking about, if you'd paid the £1,200 because you felt you had no alternative, you couldn't get it back. So even though the rule under which you paid it was unlawful, the government kept your money. That doesn't seem to me to be right. But what I do think is right is that the court should have the power in some circumstances to say that our decision is not retrospective. And yeah. Alison gave a very good example of that, but I've talked long enough in answer to your question. Um, no, no. <laughs> I think there should be a power to do it, but I certainly don't think the government should, again, I don't think the government should be telling the judges when they should uh, make things uh, non-retrospective. Let the judges work it out on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm. 
Alison, do you have concerns about the idea of making remedies prospective only rather than retrospective, particularly in respect of quashing statutory instruments? Yeah, yes, I absolutely do. And, and uh, I think this is one of the particularly concerning proposals because for a whole lot of reasons, including the ones that Lord Newberg has mentioned, but the, the, the point of bringing a judicial review is to obtain a remedy for the individual. And if you take away the court's power to do anything for that person who has suffered an injustice in most cases, then you take away a lot of the of the of the importance and the benefit of judicial review. It doesn't a prospective only remedy will not will most often not give a remedy for the person who brings the case or for all the other people that have already been affected by the unlawful decision. And um, I'm going to share with everybody um, a blog which some colleagues of mine wrote and we've done some research at PLP on the use of judicial review to challenge statutory instruments and so my second point would be that the case for change isn't made out because actually it's not very often that statutory instruments are successfully challenged by way of judicial review and even when that does happen it's not very common for the courts to quash the statutory instruments so this is a very, this is not a big problem that the government is trying to tackle here. And they're using a sledgehammer to crack a nut by taking away the court's ability to actually give proper justice and proper remedies to people. Um, if I can give a concrete example. So in a case where, um, um, as Lord Nenberg said, the statutory instrument is, is effectively made by ministers with actually quite minimal parliamentary scrutiny. And in the blog, we sort of talk about how much time is usually spent considering um, yeah. statutory instruments. And another thing yeah. about secondary legislation is that there's no opportunity to amend it. There's no. it's kind of it's, it's take it or lose it. Either, either stands or falls as it is, unlike in Parliament, where certainly in some cases you would go clause by clause through yeah. a bill saying, is this a good idea? Isn't this a good idea? There's none of that. Yeah, exactly. So we um, acted a few, a few years ago in a case called RF, which was about changes that were made to disability benefits, the personal independence payment regulations. Um, well, in that case, if the remedy, you know, that the court found that those regulations were discriminatory against mentally ill and unwell people, um, blatantly discriminatory was the words the judge used. And if we had a prospective only remedy, then all the people who had been unlawfully discriminated against in their benefits that were meant to meet their disability, their needs arising from their disabilities would have had no remedy, they would have had no relief. Um, and that is a really, you know, uh, to me, the strongest argument for taking it away. I want to make just one other point, which is, I think can, could be overlooked, which is in relation to legal aid. In, in order to get legal aid to bring a judicial review, which basically for anybody other than the most rich or big corporations is the only way to bring a judicial review, you have to show that you and, or a member of your family will directly benefit from mm. the judicial review. So if the remedy is prospective only, then it's going to be very hard to get legal aid, um, potentially. Well, unless they change the legal aid regulations, they'd have to change. Yeah. Potentially, and some, they'd have to change the regulations. And in some cases, the prospective only remedy will directly benefit you because you're going to be um, there's going to be a risk to you in the future of, of this unlawful policy being applied. So it's not fatal, but it's you know it's, it, it's all about making it harder for people to hold the government to account. Um, and Joshua, do you have any particular views about this particular issue or the review, in fact, in more general? What you're, I think you wrote about it. I think you called it an emasculation. Professor Mark Elliott, I know, has called it an evisceration of judicial review if it were to go through. Uh, what's your perspective about these proposals? As you've summed up, that's exactly what I think. I mean, just to pick up the point that, that David Newberger was making, and he's fully entitled to, uh, to, uh, to take this example because he presided over the court which decided this case. It's known to lawyers as the Unison case. Um, and it's very interesting. I was thinking about this case this afternoon, and I thought that if the government had simply accepted what Lord Folkes proposed, which is that the judges would have a discretion to... Uh, uh, decide whether to make um, the decision uh, only prospective and not retrospective, I thought that the Supreme Court would probably have ordered refunds, and judging by what Lord Newberger has just said this afternoon, uh, that's probably right. And that's why the government is considering either a presumption that remedies will be prospective only in relation to statutory instruments, or even a requirement that remedies 
should be prospective only unless there's an exceptional public interest requiring a different approach. And I certainly think that that goes too far. Um, and as you say, Professor Mark Elliott, who his PhD thesis was about judicial review, he's professor of public law at Cambridge, he's chair of the law faculty, he says, as if these proposals which risk eviscerating, eviscerating judicial review were not objectionable enough, the government is arguing that all this is to be done in the service of the rule of law. Uh, the Ministry of Justice says that Parliament focused solutions are more appropriate where statutory instruments are impugned, and it claims that legal certainty, and hence the rule of law, may be best served by only prospectively invalidating such provisions. Well, it certainly um, suits the interests of central government, because um, looking at this rather more broadly, um, what the government is proposing, and this is what Mark Elliott says, and I agree with him, is that the vast majority of unlawful administrative acts should either be not reviewable at all or should be subject to what he calls an attenuated remedial regime, which means that there would be very little opportunity for the courts to put things right. Uh, and Mark Elliott says the undesirability of the suggested reforms is as obvious as the government's naked self-interest in proposing them. Now, I don't want to be too political, but I think a lot of people in the field of judicial review, in the courts, at the bar, uh, and elsewhere, indeed everybody outside central government, would think there's quite a lot of truth in that. Uh, and that what the government is proposing is far, far further than Lord Folkes' proposals, uh, and would really um, undermine the, not just judicial review, but the rule of law, which as we said at the outset, it depends on. Now, one of the other reasons that Mark Elliott reaches that conclusion is because um, he is concerned about two other aspects which the government raises. Firstly, to clarify um, the role of ouster clauses. Now, just to explain very briefly, an ouster clause basically is a clause which says you can't judicially review something. So there are certain pieces of legislation, not very many, which in effect say you, you cannot subject them to judicial review. And there, um, the current consultation paper suggests that that should be codified, clarified, and potentially used more frequently. Secondly, there is quite a complicated argument about when things can or can't be quashed, depending upon what sort of unlawfulness we're talking about, whether or not we're talking about unlawfulness which arises because you never have had the power to do it in the first place. So if, for example, um, you were a judge whose sole role was to make decisions about family law and you suddenly started handing down sentences when somebody came before you in family law to send you to send someone to prison. That would be an obvious example of want of jurisdiction. But in most cases, most judicial review cases, that isn't the issue. And the idea would be, would be that those decisions wouldn't be able to be quashed. Alison, what's your view about those two proposals? And then if I could pass to David. If I can just start with the second, I mean, one of the one of the problems comes out, I think, from the example that you give, which is a sort of an extreme example, which is useful <laughs> to explain what we're talking about. But the problem that was faced in the past and will be faced again in the future if the government goes ahead with this is where is the line mm -hmm. and what kinds of decision are outside of jurisdiction and does a government body have jurisdiction ever to act unlawfully? And those kinds of debates, which, you know, legal academics probably enjoy debating, but it, they take up court time and they make it harder to um, achieve justice in cases. And I just, I feel like that would be a very regressive step to go back to those kinds of arguments. And then on ouster, I mean, it, there are, the idea that you would create a rule that a particular kind of decision taken by a government official or a minister or a, a local government official or a public body could never be susceptible to judicial review. The problem, the fundamental problem with that is that you can't, you, we don't know like what might happen in future and it creates this kind of blanket exclusion of particular kinds of cases from accountability and increasing the use of those rules would not be good for the rule of law or for justice in this country. David, do you have any views about those two uh, proposals about ouster clauses and the idea of nullity as it's known in legal academic circles? I, I think there are some common comments on both. 
but I think ouster clauses are worrying mm -hmm. for reasons of principle and reasons of practice. They're worrying for reasons of principle in the sense that if you have an ouster clause, it means the courts can't review the decision mm. which is within the ambit of the ouster clause, as it were. And that means that you are giving a green light uh, to unlawful decisions, which nobody can do anything about, mm. which is self-evidently contrary to the rule of law and totally unfair on people who suffer as a result and can't do anything about it. So I think in principle, as to clauses are to, be, are to be avoided. Secondly, I think as to clauses will lead to conflict between uh, the two principal branches of government in terms of the rule of law. Parliament, which stands for democracy, and the judges who stand for the rule of law. Because there are cases of recent couple of years, there was a quite a significant case, where the judges floated the idea that as to clauses, clauses which prevent the court from in intervening, should not be given effect to. Yeah. And that will become more centre stage and more serious as a point, because, as I say, there's a powerful argument for saying that they are flatly contrary to the rule of law. More generally, I think that both with the on both issues that you've raised and which Alison has spoken about, um, one comes back to the problem that judicial review involves all sorts of different cases on all sorts of different facts. And uh, to try and lay down principles of the sort that Parliament's trying to do, or that it's proposed that Parliament should do, I should say, by reference to how judges should approach certain types of cases, is to my mind a recipe for disaster, inconsistency and expense. Disaster because it all makes it uncertain and will produce injustice because you can't cater for every case. Judges are there to deal with the individual case and should be left to get on with it. If there is a general principle to be applied, that's fine. But to try and tailor things to types of case is a recipe for problems. It also leads to unnecessary expense and time because as Alison has said, you get involved in all sorts of arguments about what sort of decision it is and whether it's within this category or that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I can foresee a situation where there'll be lots of arid, extensive legal debates, which will go on, not really about the substance of the issue and the illegality, but whether or not you can challenge the illegality in the first place. Exactly. And you might have a an illegality, which is in one category, which means that you should quash, but actually it's quite a minor yeah. breach. And you might have a very, very serious procedural breach, which is in the category where you can't quash. And it seems yeah. to me it, it's simply going to lead to problems and it's trying to solve a problem that doesn't actually exist. Yeah. Um, turning now to some of the questions, we've had some excellent questions from uh, a variety of individuals. Um, the first one of which is, would mandatory suspension of quashing orders, recognising that the statutory instrument is ultra vires, but preventing the claimant from taking the benefit of that, e.g. by demanding repayments, raise a, a, an issue under Article 1 of the first protocol of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Now, this was something that, in fact, David raised uh, immediately before we had this um, debate, uh, that the claimant has had the fruits of litigation expropriated from them. So, um, David, what's your view about that as a potential argument if this were to go through? Well, I don't want to jump too enthusiastically uh, yes, on a point, the... I think there's something in it. I also occurs to me thinking about it that there may be something about access to the courts. Yeah. Because if you've got a rule which has been applied wrongly to you, is it really giving you access to the courts to say you can go to the courts but you can't get any redress? Yeah. I would have thought that there are serious human rights problems here, but yeah. quite how strong the case would be, I wouldn't want to pontificate on <laughs> At this stage. Okay, so it's don't rely on uh, David Newberg uh, if you're going to raise that argument. Um, so, um, but Joshua, I, a question I think probably for you: Do the do you feel that many of these challenges, of, i.e., the judicial review challenges, have been magnified by the seeming lack of adherence to the principle of ministerial responsibility? perhaps even some activism on the part of ministers to pursue policies that they are aware are unlawful, but wish to do so but, um, for politically expedient reasons. Well, I can't think of any obvious example where 
ministers have deliberately acted unlawfully. I dare say there are a few cases where they've pushed it a bit, but ministers usually act on advice. Sometimes they reject advice from their officials and decide to go uh, the way they want to see if it'll work. But uh, if you ask me for examples of ministers who have deliberately ignored advice and pushed ahead with a policy that they know to be unlawful, then I would have to say I can't think of any examples. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, that uh, uh, we shouldn't have judicial review because the existence of judicial review uh, makes it uh, less likely. There is a book which is, I think, now in its fifth edition, uh, which is uh, issued to civil servants and perhaps yeah. ministers see it as well. And it's called The Judge Over Your Shoulder. And the idea of it is it's meant to encourage good decision making by warning officials and ultimately the ministers they advise that if they take bad decisions, then the courts will be there to put it right. And that's there to, dis to encourage ministers to act within the law. And I think that's right. OK. Um, Alison, can I ask you a question now? Um, can I ask you a question? Somebody asked a question. Is quashing a regulation review when understanding an injustice has occurred goes against the very foundations of law and the seeking of a just society. What do you think about that as a proposal or a proposition that some of these changes do go to the heart of um, the ability of us as citizens to challenge excessive decisions by administrative decision makers? I think that's right. I think they do go to the heart of it. I think you know, the, for the reasons we've been discussing that we start off from the point that judicial review is there to ensure that government is work acts and behaves and decides within the law and if if even as a result of a successful uh challenge the unlawful act will not have you know will have very, its its repercussions of the decision will be limited to the future then that weakens the protection of judicial review. In my, I, I would agree. Um, yeah, and I really also endorse what Joshua was just saying about the about the importance of judicial review as as and the judge over your shoulder, and the effect which it has on decision making. Um, we've been talking to a sort of, um, number of lawyers who've experienced extensive experience of advising government, and they've talked about that and the positive effect which it has. And you know, government lawyers are there to advise their clients about the legality of what they're proposing to do. And then there's a political decision that's separate from that, if you like. And it is important that it has that deterrent role. Okay. Um, now this is a question to all three of you, but if I could ask if Joshua and Joshua answers it first, then followed by David and lastly by Alison. Or oh, what does the panel think of how media report on court decisions? Do they ever get frustrated when non-legally trained journalists either misrepresent decisions or fail to explain the context or constraints on the judiciary, i.e. what the court is actually being asked to decide and what the law actually allows judges to do? So, Joshua, uh, I don't think anyone's suggesting that you are a proponent of misreporting on legal issues, but uh, I, you've obviously written a book called Enemies of the People, where, a part of which... <laughs> Quick, get the book up now. <laughs> Let's have the out now. All good bookshops, which are now open as of today, rush to your local Waterstones, <laughs> um, which is all about really the the relationship between the press um, and the public and the lawyers and explaining those things. Do you get frustrated when you see some of your journalistic colleagues not explaining things in the way that you, you are so careful to do? Well, I don't want to be too rude about my colleagues, <laughs> um, but um, you talk about um, legally trained journalists. Um, there is only one legally trained journalist uh, working for um, a UK newspaper or broadcasting organization. Um, the Times political uh, Times legal editor uh, is, is legally trained. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so the, none of the others are. Um, so it's not surprising that they sometimes um, uh, don't understand things. But of course, they're under pressure. I was under pressure when I worked for the Daily Telegraph. I've written about this in the past. Um, they're under pressure to tell the story in the way that the newspaper, the news editor wants the story to be told. So you can't really blame the journalist. 
uh, for um, not going into some of the legal details. And, and that's why um, other sources of information, blogs in particular these mm -hmm. days, books, as you've kindly said, are, are so important. It is frustrating, uh, but um, there are other sources of information. As legal journalism and journalism generally has declined, um, the growth of the availability mm -hmm. of non um, of, 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 of of primary sources, for example, Hansard, for example, law reports, mm. broadcasting of law reports has increased. So it's perfectly possible for um, intelligent and interested individuals to go to primary sources, read the judgment, even watch the hearing in order to understand uh, what was uh, said rather than have to rely too much on a very short and perhaps ill-informed newspaper report. And David, I'm thinking of your time in the Supreme Court, where one of the great inventions was the fabulous summary that I'm not quite sure who it is who writes it, but it's of use to everyone, quite legally qualified or not, which explains in a page or a page and a half what the case is about and why decisions were made one way or another. So I'd say to all the law students, look at those summaries, even if you haven't studied constitutional law in any depth, because they will provide you with an excellent understanding of the basics, shall we say, about how decisions are made. But were you ever frustrated about the way that some cases you were involved with as a judge were reported? Um, I think I was sometimes a little surprised, but not very, and not that frustrated. I mean, the function of journalists and the function of judges is very different. And your point about the way the Supreme Court issues one and a half page summaries of their decisions highlights the point. I mean, many of the decisions of the Supreme Court will run through sort of 50 or 60 closely typed pages. A journalist who has to report on that, preferably that day, and if he or she is lucky, possibly the next day, has a hell of a task, particularly as Joshua says, as they are not mostly, unfortunately, legally trained. Uh, and also, uh, they have to summarize it in a few sentences often. Furthermore, they have to make it attractive to the public. And often, because the newspaper will have a political slant, they will want to slant it. And I think any judge who doesn't appreciate that as a fact of life only has himself or herself to blame if they get too upset at the way things are reported. Having said that, I do think that we lack uh, a, a cadre of journalists of the quality of Austria, if it's possible to find them, who understand uh, the position and can both look two ways, like the Greek, the Roman god Janus, see the judges, see the law, but also see the public and explain it in a way that frankly, both the public and the judges can accept as being sensible and accurate. And I think it's a great shame that the newspapers, with one exception, uh, don't do that anymore. Alison, do you have anything else you'd like to add? I would just, I suppose what I would add is this, is a point about sort of public understanding of the cases, judicial, public legal education, the importance of ensuring that there's a sort of shared understanding about what judicial review is then it doesn't fall on the individual journalist to explain it in particular cases, if yeah. there's a greater shared understanding of what judicial review is more generally. It gives a context to the cases they're reporting. Yeah. So that's one of those things where things like citizenship, politics, having sort of civics lessons in schools, which I know citizenship is a national curriculum subject, <laughs> but I think as sort of having that, in fact, interestingly, if you do the life in the UK test, I think you end up finding out more about the way that the judicial system works in the UK than you do <laughs> if you're educated in this country in reality. So yes, a very good note for us to end on, as obviously that is Legucate's role, is to bring legal education, particularly to those in secondary schools uh, and those who might not be studying law as undergraduates. So I wanted to say thank you very much to the three um, panellists for a very stimulating and interesting debate and discussion about the most up to the minute uh, complicated and difficult um, legal issues.